And welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting of April 7th, 2022. In accordance with Senate, California Senate Bill 361, this meeting is not physically open to the public. Commissioners and staff are meeting via Zoom, and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting using the Zoom application or landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comment during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, and on the published meeting agenda. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Char Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 in the city of Capitola and on Channel 25 throughout Santa Cruz County. The meeting is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. Meetings can also be streamed live on YouTube or on the city's website. Our technician tonight is Olivia Philly. And with that, why don't we go ahead with the roll call. Louis? Yes, please. Commissioner Christensen? Hello? Here. Hi, here. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Yes. Okay. Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Commissioner Rook? Here. Joe Will? Here. Let's move on then to oral communications. Are there any additions or and or deletions to the agenda? Um, planning commissioners, there are no um, deletions to the agenda. However, we did receive some public comment, um, one on 106 Cliff and the other on the Prospect Ave application. And I want to just check in. Did you all receive those and have time to review that public comment? Yes, that was the two emails. The two emails. Yes. Okay, thank Very you. Good. Very good. Okay, uh, let's move on then to public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to weigh in on any uh, item that is not on the uh, agenda or make any announcements to their choosing. They have three minutes to do so. Uh, Katie, are there any uh, members who uh, want to raise their hand or submit an email? So I do not see any emails for public comment. Now I am checking the Zoom and there are no hands raised from the Zoom. So no public comment. Okay, very good. Let's move on then to commission comment. Are there any Commission comments on items not on the agenda. No. Very good. Let's move on then to staff comments. Same question. Uh, no staff comments this evening. Okay. Next item is the consent calendar. These are items that are to be brought forward before the committee and voted as a single item. Uh, there is only one item on the consent calendar, 1835 48th Avenue. Uh, does anybody wish to pull this item? If not, or make comment on it. If not, I'm willing to uh, hear a motion for approval of the consent calendar. I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. This is Commissioner Westman. I'll second. Commissioner. We have a uh, motion to approve by Commissioner Westman and a second by Commissioner Christensen. Uh, without any further comment, uh, Louis, could we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. 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 Consent calendar passes. We'll now move on to public hearings. Uh, these are intended to make uh, the public have an opportunity for public discussion of each each of the items. Uh, we'll follow the following procedure, staff presentation, followed by planning commission questions, followed by public comments, followed by deliberation and finally decision. Item one on the public hearing agenda is 1820 41st Avenue, Suite A. Staff, do we have a presentation? Yeah, thanks, Chair Wilk. I will be delivering the staff presentation here, sharing my screen. 
So uh, this application is for a conditional use permit modification submitted by BevMo. Uh, the shopping center is the Capitola Station, and specifically BevMo is uh, adjusting a bit of their, their business model uh, and the way they operate with regard to uh, delivery from the store to customers uh, and uh, associated hours of, of operation of the delivery. Um, a little bit of, uh, well, first I'll, I'll just talk, I'll frame their, their proposal. So right now uh, they are, th this type of a service is not offered in-house, uh, only, only by third party uh, app and online based. Uh, so they're looking to manage to bring this uh, delivery of uh, their products in-house. Um, and they are expanding a little bit of their inventory uh, percentage to sell more non-alcohol related products. And uh, they're proposing alcohol delivery, basically all hours not prohibited by state law and uh, delivery of non-alcohol products 24 hours a day. Uh, there, the existing use permit is in good standing, never had any, uh, any code enforcement action. So BevMo is in good standing. It was established in 2008. Uh, there's some language in both the staff report and conditions to regulate hours and then delivery to store. Uh, behind the store, there's a residential proximity, um, but there, there was not any discussion of um, delivery from store to customers. So uh, we needed to address that with this proposal. So our analysis, uh, we worked side by side with the police department. Um, we kind of did a sweep of other jurisdictions in the county, uh, as well as looked at uh, what other app-based personal shopping services are available, and then also just available online information of hours uh, of, of both liquor store and convenience stores. What we found is uh, other than maybe a handful of uh, pre-existing long-standing uh, liquor stores and convenience stores in Santa Cruz, by and large, either market-driven or regulated, uh, these stores close between 10 p.m. and midnight. And so in looking at this delivery, we, we didn't want to uh, go so far as to create a new precedent. And so with a recommendation tonight, we are uh, recommending that they stop the alcohol delivery at midnight while the other delivery could continue. So specifically, this is just paraphrasing some of the conditions. So stopping at midnight, uh, we had to amend a couple of the conditions to uh, make differentiate of delivery to store from a warehouse or other versus uh, to store or from store to customers. So there's some minor modifications to language there. Uh, and then we want to do not introduce a new impact to the adjacent residential neighborhood. So uh, we're asking that they stage out of the front door after regular business hours. So there'd be a 9 p.m. cutoff uh, for these delivery drivers to load and, uh, and, uh, and stage from the front door. And then we're also recommending a one-year follow-up, so it'd be just a, a simple return trip to the, the Planning Commission um, to report out any, any issues that, uh, that had come up in the one year. So with all of that, uh, we are recommending approval uh, with the conditions as discussed. And uh, I will just note the applicant is uh, not intending to make a presentation, uh, but they are on standby for any questions. So I'm available for questions as well. Is the uh, is the police um, department available for questions? I have a question on their report. I don't think they had availability this evening, uh, unless that changed last minute, Katie. Yeah, our captain who's been working on this is on vacation this week, but she, uh, we met with her several times and we're prepared to answer questions for them, hopefully. Okay, well, uh, I'll wait until uh, discussion then. We can discuss it as a group. Are there any other uh, questions of the presentation um, by any of the commissioners? I had a quick question. Courtney. Um, I'm wondering what, you guys said that it was um, a study of the deliveries that are available till midnight. Um, is that, I mean, 
Did you get an Uber Eats to deliver, you know, a couple bottles of wine after midnight from Safeway? Is that, was that kind of the comparison or is it more of, you know, the gas stations and liquor stores are closed? Is that more of the comparison? Yeah, I think what we looked at was just like, just from a market standpoint, how late are stores that are selling liquor open? Mm -hmm. And um, both from the regulatory side and just, um, you know, what are posted hours of operation. And so um, what we found was, yes, you can get a personal shopper to go to go shop for you, but, um, you know, only to stores that are open. So, um, you know, I think that's why we're making the difference between uh, the non-alcohol related products. So we want them to be competitive mm -hmm. and allowed to compete with the, the market for that delivery. And then the other was, you know, the kind of the other side of the coin is, you know, we don't want to create a new precedent with this, uh, allowing this business to, to operate past midnight selling liquor where um, we didn't find any others in Capitola. Um, Watsonville just doesn't allow it. Uh, Santa Cruz has an ordinance that requires a uh, city council approval, and the staff person we talked to said nobody had actually pursued that. They all just decided to to, to stop business at midnight. So, oh. a little bit more details of what kind of what we went through to to come to this conclusion. But it's a it's a combination of both regulatory and what we just see out there as posted information. Okay, thanks. I was just curious. <laughs> Any other questions from the commissioners? Uh, if not, let's move on to public comments. Do we have any, uh, well, you mentioned that the applicant uh, is available but doesn't wish to make a presentation. Are there any other public comments on Zoom or email? I am not seeing any hands raised on Zoom and our public comment email, there have been no messages received. All right, then let's move on to planning commission deliberations. Anybody wish to weigh in on this topic? If no one else does, I do have a, a, a question and, and it's this is what I kind of wanted to discuss with the with the police captain. Um, and the thought is, so in Santa Cruz, the, the nearest 7-Eleven, they, they sell beer and alcohol and wine 24-7, right? So they're open 24 hours a day. So I or someone wanted to go out and, and get liquor between the hours of midnight and 2 a.m., there's a good chance that the party had already been started and now they just need to resupply. So that would create the risk of uh, a DUI. So now all of a sudden you have someone driving to Santa Cruz just across town to pick up more liquor and now we've got a, a traffic hazard. So to me, the notion of that person staying home and getting their alcohol delivered to them is safer than, than not. So I, that, I kinda wanted the police to weigh in on that. Did you ask them that question by any chance, Katie? We did. Um, you know, the, the flip side to that is that if, if um, liquor were to be delivered to a home having a house party between the hours of midnight and 2 a.m., it felt like they could also be contributing to an issue of people driving home after getting more alcohol delivered to a party between those hours. So really after midnight, um, the access is to, as you stated, the 7-Elevens, and um, there are those um, drivers available that um, you can order a personal shopper to go buy, to order beer or wine, and it would be delivered to your home. Um, there aren't many liquor establishments that are open past midnight, and however, bars, several bars in Capitola will stay open till 2 a.m., but not many. So they felt that, like the risk was higher by allowing more alcohol to be delivered to parties um, after midnight than um, if somebody wanted to 
order beer or wine, they could do so through the local 7-Eleven using an Instacart or other service like that. So they really were, were they don't want to, um, they didn't really want to add to a, a, they create a service that hasn't been established in the county. And as we did the research looking, as Brian did the research looking at our um, neighboring jurisdictions, there really isn't this service available for hard alcohol after midnight. And so allowing, uh, they thought it was reasonable to just stop delivery of alcohol at midnight to be kind of consistent with what is up there at this time. Thank you, that's a very thorough answer. Are there any other, is there any other discussion on this issue? Well, I, I did have a comment. Go ahead, Commissioner Newman. So the only uh, question I have is I'm really not sure what the effect of a one-year check-in on the conditional use permit is. Um, the commission, as I understand it, uh, we don't have any power once a conditional use permit is issued to modify it. Um, so I guess we could if, if refer it to uh, for enforcement if we thought that there were violations going on. But other than that, I don't see what the point of it is. Uh, maybe I'm, maybe there's some uh, something I'm misunderstanding about that. If we're just a one year conditional use permit and then it was up for renewal, that would be a different story. Brian, um, would you like me to respond to that? Um, sure, go ahead. Um, so this has been a practice we've used for some of our, when of our newer application comes in where we haven't had delivery of alcohol in the past. We have, with our food trucks, we recently did a one-year check-in and it was successful. Um, but I, I do think, I, I don't have the condition in front of me, but we could, on the conditions, State, um, that conditions could be modified depending if there's if there's new impacts realized over one over the year. So, well, I think that would be a good idea to uh, so the applicant was aware of that that one year that there was some uh, teeth in it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Westman has her hand up. Uh, yeah, I had my hand up, but I think Katie did a good job. I do believe that we can have uh, a review of a use permit and add additional conditions as long as we put it in the use permit that it will be reviewed and there's a possibility of additional conditions at that one year review. So, but Katie took care of that. So for, for me, I, I really don't have any problems with this if we stick with the midnight time frame. Um, I think that makes a whole lot of sense and it's hard for me to believe that BevMo is going to uh, succeed or fail on the amount of liquor that they sell between midnight and two o'clock that is going to be delivered to people's homes. So. Um, I would be willing to make a motion to approve the application with the conditions, uh, adding the comment about that there could be additional conditions at the one year review period on the conditional use permit and staying with the midnight delivery number. I'll second the motion with those amendments. We have a motion by Commissioner Westman and a second by Commissioner Ruth, um, are, is there any further discussion on this? Um, if not, okay, let's uh, let's take a vote. Could we have a roll call, please, Felice? Sure. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Sometimes I want to say no just to get my point across, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's unanimous. Um, okay, we are able to move on then to item B, which is 106 Cliff Avenue. Do we have a staff presentation? Yes, one moment.
everybody see that? Not yet. Not yet. There it is. <laughs> All right. Good evening, commissioners. The application before you is for 106 Cliff Avenue. The application includes a design permit, historic alteration, alteration permit, coastal development permit, and variance request to a three-story historic three-story single-family residence at 106 Cliff Avenue, as I mentioned. Um, site, uh, as shown here, the uh, property is located in the Depot Hill neighborhood, surrounded by a variety of historic properties, first, second, uh, and three-story structures along the uh, Cliff Avenue street facing the Capitol Village. The application is including 673 square feet of additions and modifications to the primary dwelling unit and for the demolition of two non-historic structures located along the rear property line and to construct a new accessory structure that includes an accessory dwelling unit and a two-car garage. The new ADU is 698 square feet and the detached garage is 457 square feet. Just to be clear, these are detached from the primary dwelling unit, which is why I refer to them as detached, but they are themselves attached to each other. That is any clearer. This is the proposed site plan. All parking is located in the rear, in and in front of the detached garage. The uh, colored circles indicate the existing proposed and proposed removal trees. The two green towards the side of the structure would be new. The four trees uh, being proposed for removal are in orange towards the rear of the property, and the blue represents the large coast redwood, which is proposed for preservation. The applicant did include a arbor support by Nigel Belton uh, supporting those removals on the basis of either the condition of the trees, the proposed development, or both. Uh, now on to the elevations. I've, I've done side by side, so it should be easy if we need to refer back to them. This is the existing and front, um, existing and proposed front, excuse me. The blue area indicates the new massing. Um, and this is the most publicly visible <clears throat> elevation. Um, most of the, ele the additions are, are located on the side and the rear of the structure. Um, and within the existing roof line, there is a new stepped gable in the front and a cross gable to the side. <clears throat> the design will also recreate the original front porch, front covered porch, which was converted to conditioned space in the late 1900s. the existing and proposed south side elevation. The existing and proposed north side elevations. Most of the massing, as you can see, is actually focused on this elevation and towards the rear of the structure, partially obscured by existing roof line. And this is the proposed rear elevations, the existing and proposed. A new second story deck is also proposed in the rear, accessible from within the residence and by an external spiral staircase. This is the um, third story. The structure includes a unique third story with three spaces of varying ceiling heights. The entire turret space and, the, and a portion of the central space currently exceed four feet in height and thus count towards the FAR um, calculation. In order to gain additional floor area, the applicant is proposing to reduce the ceiling heights of the forward and central spaces to less than four feet. Uh, the applicant referenced the above photos, noting the limited function and size of the existing spaces. Uh, this is from the side, one of the side elevations, and the areas in blue approximate the new third story ceiling heights as they'd be um, from the outside. Ceiling heights? Right. I mean, the second story ceiling height? That would be the third story ceiling height where it says proposed. Sure. 
shown above are cross sections representing new ceiling heights, which would not exceed four feet as shown above. Uh, during review, staff raised concerns regarding the uh, proposal to bring down ceiling heights in order to gain floor area in other areas. Typically, the floor area exemption is utilized for remainder spaces, such as below staircases, and to design roof pitches and attic spaces that were not intended as condition areas to not count towards the floor area. This is the first uh, instance that staff could find where an application uh, proposed to lower internal ceiling heights in order to exempt existing floor area. Staff is deferring to the discretion of the Planning Commission whether lowering internal ceiling heights is an acceptable application of the code. The application includes a uh, uh, detached ADU, as mentioned before. The ADU is designed and, and proposed to be subject to the limited standards covered in our code. If this came in by itself, it would be a ministerial application, uh, and I should say by, by itself and not including the garage element. Um, but the ADU itself complies with those limited standards uh, for a maximum size of 800 square feet, maximum height of 16 feet, and the four foot rear and side setbacks. It also complies with the objective standards to blend a attached or detached accessory dwelling unit on a historic site. So briefly covering some of the historic findings themselves, uh, early review by uh, Mr. Bergstein, our um, project architectural historian, uh, came back with some recommendations and some notes of what was considered significant on the structure, uh, notably the complex roof mats, being the, uh, the high-pitched uh, roofs, gable roofs, the southwest corner tower, and a lot of the cladding on the exterior and the um, number of the original windows that have um, unique uh, sashed pattern from the V-groove siding. So following the initial staff meeting with the applicant, uh, we gave back feedback regarding these recommendations. Um, Mr. Bergstein subsequently reviewed the revised plans, which the applicant had uh, adapted based on those recommendations and found them to be in compliance with the standards. I just noted some of the, the main points that would cover the in Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation, being that they preserve the majority of visible windows, original windows, maintain the unique shingles and shingle patterns on the front and side elevations, uh, recreate the covered front porch, remove the existing non-original sash windows that were added sometime when that, that front porch was enclosed, and locates much of the new massing to the rear and side to minimize public visibility. Um, the, and he also noted that the new proposed ADU and garage structure was um, also in finding with the standards uh, that it was distinct and com complementary of the, the existing structure. So there are a couple variance requests with this application. The applicant, the applicant is requesting a uh, variance for two different height standards, one for the maximum height of a, a chimney or some sort of projection, and then for that of the actual massing itself. The, the blue areas, again, represent the new massing. The lower red lines that you see, the solid red lines, indicate a height of 27 feet, and then the dashed line above represents a height of 28 feet. Those are the maximum heights that would be applicable to this project, given that it is a historic structure. I'm gonna cover that a little bit more in the next slide, um, that the maximum allowed height for chimneys is 28 feet, regardless of whether or not it is historic. I'm going to cover a bit of the, the site findings here. So the structure is historic and protected within capital zoning code and, and within CEQA. The primary structure is on a sloped lot with a 
with steep existing roofs, which impose difficulties in designing compatible additions that also comply with the height limitations for the zone. The starred properties represent um, the few properties along Cliff Avenue that actually do exceed the allowable height limitations. And then the one to the top represents the only property in this area that staff could find where they had a uh, existing chimney that also exceeded any height limitations that we allowed. And to cover some of that slide again, this is a table showing the, the various height limitations that apply to the R1 zone. Typically, you have a maximum height of 25 feet for uh, the primary mm -hmm. massing. That is actually increased to 27 feet for historic structures such as this, especially when they are trying to uh, match it with the existing roof lines, which the applicant uh, has done here in the staff in staff's opinion. And then for chimneys, they are allowed to exceed the base height of 25 feet by three feet, and the code explicitly states that that is um, regardless of whether or not it's a historic structure. So it's 28 feet for both historic and non-historic structures. The proposed variance would um, allow an increase to the massing height uh, by eight inches and uh, an increase to the uh, chimney to 41 feet instead of 28. While staff was able to make findings to support the variance for the uh, massing on, on the, uh, the additions, staff could not find, uh, make findings for B, C, and E to support a variance for the proposed chimney. The structure does already have an existing chimney, and if they wanted to uh, create some new um, heating, they could find other means or locations to do so. And again, as staff know, there's there's not much of a precedent for this in the area or in the zone to allow something of, of this stature and that it wasn't something that enhanced the original design. The uh, arch or the historical architectural historian noted that this did not appear to be an original feature. So that didn't see that this would enhance the uh, historic nature of it in any way. Sorry, could I interrupt? I know this is a little bit out of yeah, yeah. Norm, but I, the, uh, number B or letter mm -hmm. B uh, uh, privileges enjoyed by other property. So do you just mention that others, other properties on Cliff Avenue that have chimneys that exceed the maximum? So isn't that uh, justification for B? Did I miss something? Uh, we could cover that more at the end if you'd like, but I would say that typically when uh, the planning department reviews variance applications in regards to whether or not it's enjoyed by other properties. It, we try to focus on what seems to be a trend rather than an, a, just a singular example. All right, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. To summarize, uh, in the staff report, staff recommended that the commission approve the project but deny the variance for the chimney. However, as brought up earlier in this presentation, staff does still have concerns about setting a precedence for floor area by lowering ceiling heights. The commission may uh, continue the application and provide direction for modification if they have similar uh, concerns. With that, I will hand it over to the commission for any questions and comments. Any questions or comments by the commissioners? Let me see if there's hands raised. Any? Uh... Any questions? Susan, uh, Commissioner Westman uh, raised her hand uh, first. Yeah, I, I wondered if you could show us an elevation that shows the existing chimney on the house. I don't remember seeing that. It's, uh, let me see if it's not actually shown on the plans. I'll see if that photo we included no. captures yeah, it. I, I, I don't think it does. That's, that's correct. One moment. Yeah, you can't see from so I, I can put up a photo if you'd like, but the the chimney only protrudes, I think, a couple feet above the, the roof line, and the rest of it's a metal vent. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make certain I hadn't missed it. 
Very good. Um, Commissioner Newman, you also have your hand up. What is the proposed use of the three foot 11 inch height area? I, I believe they saw it as being, I, I mean, I, I'd rather let the applicant specify that, but I imagine as attic space, or do you mean the space above it? No, I mean that space. So they, they've been referring to it as attic space. So I, that's my assumption. So don't, don't we have situations where people have attics that uh, aren't included in their floor area ratio calculations? That's correct. And storage areas that are not really living at livable space. Yes, that's true. And that's why I, I, I mentioned that as an explicit example of where this exemption does often apply. Um, but usually that's in a design phase where the, the architect or designer would actually design roof pitches and plate heights to make sure that space did not exceed four feet or if it did, they, they understood that those areas would actually count towards their floor area calculation. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Root. Yeah, this is the question for Sean. How does, how does the ceiling height, the adjusted ceiling height affect the cupola and, and how will that be utilized? Um, that the latter part of your question, I think I would, it would be best deferred to the applicant. Um, as for how it would appear, I can I can pan back to the the image I have that superimposed the new heights. If you'd like, yeah, could you please? Yes. We did ask uh, to clarify with the the architect whether or not this would have a visual impact because it was our impression that it it would drop below the, the top part of the window. And this is an estimation, but it does appear it would. The architect clarified that it, they did not believe it would have any visible appearance or alteration from the outside, but um, you may want them to clarify that. So does the upper portion of the cupola then become unused space? With windows. <laughs> That, that's my assumption. And the ceiling height of the cupola is certainly more than four feet, correct? Not sure how high that goes up or if there's another ceiling above that or if it extends to the, the top of the spire. I thought it, uh, when I was in there years ago, I thought it extended to the top of the spire. I think there's a picture of it, isn't there? There the is. Presentation. It does not angle up, but yes, we have a picture. Okay. So you can see a part of it does climb, but I don't know how high that goes. Certainly more than four feet, it appears. Any other questions, Commissioner? Yeah. I just I just like some more clarification from that on that from the applicant. Uh, I agree. I agree. This whole this business with the cupola seems very weird. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I'm not sure what the appropriate um, Robert's rules are on this. Should we, uh, Katie? Is it, should we just get our comments to staff, or should we also include comments to the applicant at this point? Why don't we wait until I, I, public comments when the applicant uh, is there, and we can ask questions at that point? Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, uh, then, uh, Commissioner Newman, if you're done, let's move on to Commissioner Christensen. You have questions as well. Um, I just had a quick question for staff. I'm wondering if, um, since the turret is, or the cupola is um, original, and it could be considered a unique historical feature, um, it, I mean, it does present a challenge with their design, is there a way to use that as the support in their variance of saying that that's the unique situation that they're having to negotiate? And maybe just this, this whole um, discussion is kind of just semantics about pushing the ceiling height down? 
Is that? I, I can chime in there. So um, the Planning Commission could consider um, like within the variance, you know, we, we just looked that the applicant brought it in to show a decrease in floor air by dropping the ceiling height, which is something we have not seen in the past, and it meets like the like the the definition, but it doesn't quite meet the intent in our mm -hmm. overview. Um, however, you are allowed to grant a variance for floor area ratio within the code. So if that were something that you'd want to consider, that is an open to the planning commission. I just I just my my intuition is. It just seems really silly to try to just say that they're going to lower the ceiling height in a existing cupola. It just seems it just doesn't sit right. I'm, I just feel like it would seem better for precedent and all the other, you know, future applicants if they were just to say, you know, we understand it's a cupola. We understand that, you know, it has a a height that's greater than four feet, but we're allowing it because it's an existing historical architectural element and we don't need to fool ourselves by lowering the ceiling kind of thing. But I don't know, it's just my, my first thought. <laughs> I'm going to read through the floor area exceptions and see if there's anything there for historic, but I think we only allow an exception for height for historic features. Sean, correct me if you, if you already know the answer to this. Well, while she's doing that, let me just say, it, it, it occurs to me that there's one thing to ask for a variance of floor area ratio. It's another thing to create floor area by putting in false ceilings. It seems like anybody, a homeowner, could do that and say, okay, I'm going to cut every room in my house in half and say, okay, it's really under four feet. Take in the false ceiling, get approval, take out the false ceiling, boom, I'm back to... So I'm not saying this applicant would do that, but, I mean, it's a... It, it opens the door to gaming the system for other applicants. So I'd rather, would have rather seen this as a request for variance to floor area ratio than to say, oh no, we're compliant because we dropped the ceiling. That, that's kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with that sentiment. I, I think right. that, but, but moreover is I'm understanding what the applicant is saying. He's saying that my attic space is useless I don't really want to count that as floor area because I'd like to put a useful addition on the structure, you know, and, and just eliminate the attic space altogether. And okay, that's understandable. I would be perfectly fine with, with considering lowering those ceiling heights to meet the code and just kind of just ignore that space. But the, the cupola just seems like it should just be addressed in a different way. It should just be addressed in a way that, that says we're not lowering the ceiling or doing anything silly. We're just considering it as a historical feature and um, usable space, not usable space, kind of it's a moot point, you know? But that's... I, I have some questions uh, that are not actually on this, on the cupola. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a question on the side setback on the north side, if we can bring up that slide. Um, that shows the um, north side. So, yeah, um, is that the right picture? The, the where they have the the overhang that was added in the '60s on the is that in the on the left there existing north elevation? Uh, go back a slide. I don't think that's the one. No, that's not it. So this is the north, and it, it's the one on the left-hand side, if you're looking from the front. This is where so the four traps yeah. are on the side. So if we're looking from the front, basically facing north, the left-hand side is uh, where there's currently a pass-through with steps going up and then the overhang, which was added in the 60s, according to the historic reference. You want the west elevation. So when, so we're look. so yeah, you're right. I want the west elevation. Do I want the west elevation? Yes, the west elevation. Yeah, there we go. There we go. 
So currently on on the uh, left side of that, you see that overhang that, correct me if I'm wrong, um, is why I'm asking. It, um, that overhang was added in the 60s and then and then currently that that's a visual site all the way to the to the backyard and they're proposing that they put a a wall in the back of that overhang so that that sight line disappears and then that extension which is already non-compliant with a six-foot setback then becomes uh, like a one foot setback from the property line. Is that correct? Let me just make sure I'm understanding this. So if we're, we're looking okay, at that porch. So over at the top of the screen, you say you say you see that angled lot line, mm -hmm. and then you see in the upper left hand corner of the lot, you see the steps coming up, and then onto the porch. Yes. So currently not shown in this picture is an overhang on that porch so that they can walk in the side door and not be rained on, which was added in the 60s, according to the report, I think. So, so currently the way this is shown, you see a decent setback from the property line, six feet or more. But this uh, redesign then takes the wall, which is they're going to put on the back of the porch, and extends it almost all the way to the property line, which then encloses the back portion of, of the overhang, which was also added in the 60s to make it further non-compliant with a six-foot setback. My question is, is, aren't we effectively allowing a zero lot line exemption on this? I mean, there, we're basically so, eliminating the setback. Period. So I, I want to point out, and it's hard to see on this image, but we have it on the engineering plans as well as the existing conditions survey, and the architect had superimposed it here. There's a faint outline, dashed line along here, that shows the existing extent of the uncovered and the covered porch areas that, that wraps around to the back. This line right here that, that gets that's closest to the northern property line is shared with the existing uh, porch area, which does have, which also has an existing covered porch. So the, the applicant has redesigned that, but is uh, not from uh, our staff review on this, uh, exacerbating that area. There's also um, a second story deck that wraps around and they're maintaining the extent of that as well. As, as far as uh, new, they're, they're showing that the new massing, the additions would still meet the first or, or second as, as applicable size setbacks. All right, well, you've answered my question. Um, I do have an issue with that. I can discuss it later. Uh, are there... Uh, just to be clear, they are meeting the, the first and second story setbacks for the new addition. And they're not exacerbating the non-conforming porch. So the, that wall that they're putting on the back, uh, what are they calling it, a fence? So what you're seeing is because it's two-dimensional, when you're looking at the view from the street, you're actually um, seeing, I don't know if you can see my, you probably can't see my cursor, but if you were to stand, Sean, if you can put your cursor at the top of those stairs and you were to look straight back, without looking at an angle, you would be viewing the new addition, that wall that jets out, I'm gonna guess about four or five feet where Sean's pointing. That's what you're seeing from that front elevation. But in actuality, they maintain the setback from the blue, the turquoise blue property line is way out. It's, Sean, do you so know what that measurement is? From yeah, this, this measurement here is about eight feet. From from this from these points to the property line, it's about eight feet two inches. Okay, let me, so I think you you think you convinced me, but let me make sure that I understand this. So that porch, that is is the back of that porch. That there is there is not a wall that goes up and covers the first story that goes from the the house to the basically to the lot line. You're saying no. there is not a wall there. No. That's an illusion. What you're doing is looking through the porch and seeing the house yeah. in the back. 
That's correct. If you were to stand towards the center of the lot and look back, I, I think you'd still be able to see towards the rear of the lot. But if you were standing over here, maybe looking straight, maybe not. All right, that clarifies a lot. That was there was been, that was difficult to to see from the drawings, but that's okay. Thank you. That was very that was very helpful. Uh, any other questions of staff? If not, we can move on to public comment. Um, so, this, go ahead. Okay, I was going to say the architect is here and has his hand raised for public comment. Yeah, let's let's get the applicant first. Go ahead. Cove Britain. Oh, Sean, I think you're going to have to. I can, but I, I was going to suggest that because we do have, it looks like um, you might have already sent it to the commission, but we did receive a, a public comment that Mr. Britton may want an opportunity to respond to. You know, I think it would be best to have, allow Cove to answer the planning commissioner's questions first, and then we can move on to public comment and additional answers if necessary. Understood. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Britton, we've uh, unmuted you there, so. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's always, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's a late evening. Uh, I have to say my, my, uh, my youngest daughter just got an award graduating from college, and but I'm still here. <laughs> so that would, might not mean anything, but it, it, it's, I appreciate that you're here, and I'm sure this was a, a, is a long night for you all. Um, so uh, the ceiling height up in the attic, and I have to say I really appreciate uh, Commissioner Christensen's uh, comments about it because it's a difficult situation because that space is unusable, period. And I don't want to lower this, the ceiling height in there. And frankly, I can barely walk into that space. So why is that space counted as square footage? Well, I understand the Capitola's um, ordinances regarding that, right? Because you're trying to avoid having that massing and so on. But this is a very old home. Um, and it has conditions that are unusual. Nobody would ever put in a turret like that currently because it would count as square footage, even though it's unusable. Uh, the only thing I've ever heard that's been used by, and which I wouldn't encourage anyway, because that's just a personal preference, is some guy that like used to like to sit there and play his drums. Yeah, you know, it's not usable space and it's not actually accessible in a legally way to get there so we're willing to drop the height on it we don't want to but it's not usable we're not trying to game the system we're just like going we're being penalized for square footage that is unusable and if anybody was designing a new house they wouldn't include it um and and seriously it's fine to continue this hearing to discuss that more my client is not here and so on uh, but i think it's a good discussion because it's like going what do you do with these old houses but then again how often do they come up so i i think this is an unusual also project because this is one of the older homes in capitola one of the tallest ones and it also violates various various um, zoning codes at this point, and building codes for that matter. So how do you deal with these, and how do you do, do them in a good way? And I believe my client and I have really made a great effort to do so, but I think it's not a bad discussion to have. Um, I wanna say also that I think Sean has done an exceptional job, frankly. Uh, and the presentation, which I really appreciate. Um, I don't agree with some things. I was uh, somewhat disturbed that we hadn't been informed that they were challenging the chimney. And I have to go to the chimney. This becomes a problem because chimneys are, or wood burning fireplaces are, uh, as of right, uh, everybody 
in, frankly, the county of Santa Cruz, Monterey, and Capitola, and the city of Santa Cruz have the right for a wood-burning fireplace. Whether you agree with that or not, they all have that right. And so if this wasn't a public hearing, how would that be handled? Because if you install the wood-burning fireplace, it has to have, by building code, a certain clearance from the roof. I, that's just the way it is. So I go, well, we have to have that. My client understandably wants one because it's consistent with the style of architecture that they have, Queen Anne. You would want a wood burning fireplace. Um, I don't, that's a preference, but everybody in the county of Santa Cruz and Capitola has that right. So do you want to make the precedence that you're not allowed to have one unless it meets the current height limits. Frankly, I think that's a bit of a problem in Capitola's code that happens, that it doesn't recognize that particular conflict that you just have to have a chimney that's above the height limit. If the existing roof it is above the height limit, if, if that's understandable. I'm like going, let's say you had a old house, you wanted to put a wood burning uh, fireplace, you needed to put it someplace for whatever reason, in a different place, it is allowed axiomatically, but you would have to get a variance for the height of it because the existing roof exceeds the height limit. Again, how often is it going to happen? How many times are we all going to see a house of this height? Not often. But I did send a um, shot from a book showing historical, and it's not unusual to have a chimney of this height or this style of house at all. But if staff and the planning commission want to discuss how we can make it more attractive, my client is more than happy to discuss that with you all. Um, but he feels very, you know, very convinced that he wants a wood burning traditional fireplace in his house. And I certainly support that. Um, you know, for now that we're allowed to, for now we're allowed to do them. And for this type of house, I would hate to see a gas um, fireplace there. They still look like not much. And venting them out the side is unattractive and it's appropriate for this house, uh, stylistically and so on. So other than that, I don't have much to say, frankly. Uh, the neighbors appear to support the project. I have not heard anybody objecting. Maybe somebody is objecting. It's the first time I've heard it. But I'm, you know, the, both my client and I are happy to continue this and have more discussion on it. So I think it, it's brought some good discussions. You know, it's like, well, do you count these type of spaces that are unusable in a historical houses? The historic, historical, historic houses. Yeah, I, they're unusable. There's nothing. I, I've been through that space. I can't get to the turret without bending over. Um, it's not usable space. Should it be counted in this situation? But maybe it's a variance versus us having to uh, play stupid human pet tricks. Uh, I certainly respect that. So um, I'm going to leave it there and just you know, respond whatever questions you have. I have a question, uh, Mr. Uh, Britton. The, you're saying that the, the cupola is inaccessible. You're saying that there is no stairway or drop-down ladder to the attic? How, how do you get up there? No, there's a, a stairway to an attic room that has full height. We counted that as square footage, by the way. Um, it, so think of, you have a three-story house. There's no question we have a three-story house. Um, and there is a room at the back of the house that we counted as square footage because it's clearly accessible. Um, but there's a door to a space that doesn't meet 
uh, it's not a 6A door, let's put it that way. It's a attic access door. Um, okay. And so you can go through that door, I can go through it, but I go through it hunched over. Uh, my wife, not so much. Yeah, and my kid wouldn't be so much. But it's not a space that's viable to use. It's not a legal space under building code, meaning that that it's not viable. I mean, if you guys want to give us a variance to make it viable, you know, love to do it. My client wanted it, and I said, no. You know, that space, enlarging that and making it viable, it's, it's problematic on so many so many levels, yeah. It would violate the historic character of the building. It would violate building code. And I'm like, okay. oh, you that, answers my, that answers my yeah, question. Sorry. One one other question that was actually brought up by Commissioner Ruth was the, the height of the, the cupola. Is that open or is there a, a, a roof? It is. It's tall. I can stay in the in the in. I can stand in the center of it straight up. But if I go try to step by the window, no, I can't. It's not a usable space, yeah. But you can't get to it. You can't get to it through a usable space. And again, I don't want to lower the ceiling height. I'm just like going, why can't it? All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one. Uh, 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 Commissioner Ruth has got his hand raised. Yeah, Mr. Britton, in the in the cupola third space with the floor or the ceiling being dropped down it, it appears that it like hits the windows midway is that the case no we could drop the ceiling so we have blind windows you wouldn't be able to tell from outside but i agree with uh, commissioner christensen it's silly but you guys tell me how to best address an unusable space that's being counted square footage. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the public benefit is. Um, maybe there is one, I don't know. So we're just trying to go, look, we would like to use the square footage that this cupola represents um, and we'll drop, drop it down. Nobody from the public will ever see. Yeah, that's you know, I agree. It seems ridiculous to me to drop the it ceiling. Is, it's, it's completely ridiculous, but, you know, you guys tell me. <laughs> you know, you okay. could also say no, but all it does is I make the ADU bigger, which, so what? You know, you know it's sort of like going, the garage gets smaller and the ADU gets bigger. You know, <laughs> we, you know and that's where I'm like going, it's, it, I just don't quite know what to do. And I have no problem, again, continuing this for a discussion of like, I, I'm I the applicant not to keep repeating himself because we do have a long meeting. Sorry. <laughs> okay, very good. Are there any other questions of the applicants? Okay, thank you, Mr. Britton. Um, are there any public comments? We did, we, we have one more um, person on Zoom that would like to comment, Sean Galena, and I'll need Sean to allow him to speak. And then we do have a written comment as well from Carolyn Swift. Sean Galena, I believe you can speak now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can yes. you hear me? Okay. Yeah, my name is John Galena and uh, I live behind 106 Cliff. I live on 113 Central, been here for 25 years, and just had a few things to, to say about it. Um, and also, my brother's an architect is on the, on the uh, Zoom meeting, too, if I, if, if, he, if I don't speak well in these terms. But uh, the main uh, thing I had was, you know, with the ADU, they got that uh, chimney uh, right in the middle of my backyard, about 10 feet behind. And, uh, you know, I have a two story house and the height of that chimney is like right at my second floor. So I'm concerned if it's solid fuel burning chimney, that that smoke's gonna end up right in you know, my backyard and in my second floor. 
So I, I was wondering if that could be gas uh, instead. I, I understand. I heard the whole thing about wood and uh, and the historic house, but I don't think the ADU has to have a historical wood burning uh, situation. Um, and then also, I mean, if if you agree with that, that it's you know the, with the wood, because you know it'll just all so the winds primarily blow from the west and the northwest, which would put it right into my house. Uh, and then if, if, yeah, well, that's one thing. That's the main thing that I have. And also the, there's that tree, that, um, coastal, uh, redwood tree. If you look on the drawings, you can see the canopy comes very close to that chimney top. And is that, you know, with the arborist or, you know, or just safety reasons having it, where they're going to have to keep cutting that coastal redwood back to make for that chimney so it doesn't get too much heat near the tree is that going to be an issue so you know short of it i'd just like to see the chimney gone if that's possible the owners and the architect think that's okay maybe it was the gas vented out the side somewhere away from the tree and not even have a chimney there that would be really great um and plus the chimney goes above the uh the 16 foot height limit that ad users are supposed to have so that's another height thing. Um, so that was my main considerations. But the other, another thing I was hoping or looking at was the had a variance for the garage height. Garages are only supposed to be 15 feet, and they want to make the garage almost 16 feet, like the ADU. And I'm wondering, instead of bringing it all up to 16 feet because it's all connected, if we could just all have it at 15 feet, that would decrease the bulk and the, you know, of the, of the unit a little bit at all. And it would still have that consistent roof line that they wanted. And it wouldn't be as, a little bit less imposing if it was all at 15 feet instead of that 16 feet. Um, the, uh, that's my second point. My third point, oh, am I out of time? So that means is if, um, if they ever have to do redesign uh, the back of the house at all, I, I, they're pushing back the uh, the southeast corner quite a bit, about 15 feet, which is going to, you know, of course, take away a bunch of my ocean view that I have that I like. If they would ever consider um, flip flopping the, the 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 deck and the room on the second floor, taking bedroom number two and moving it from the southeast to the northeast corner, and taking the deck and moving it from the northeast to the southeast corner, that way I would just be looking over a deck instead of into to have my ocean view instead of having a bedroom obstructing the ocean view. They would still have their deck, they still have their rooms, wouldn't change anything. The deck would also be a south facing, so it would be sunnier, warmer deck, and it would also have an ocean view because they could see the ocean off that deck. Where the deck is right now, you can't see the ocean. It's just all blocked. So they'd have an ocean view deck. Yeah, it's sunny. Finish up. So that I just was hoping that maybe they would consider that if they had to uh, uh, redo anything. Uh, All right, thank you, Mr. Galina. Those please, are... The chimney on the ADU is my biggest concern. Thank you, Mr. Galina. Those were uh, those were great comments. Um, Katie, uh, are there any other applicant or any other uh, members of the public with their hands raised? Um, no, it looks like uh, I do have one comment that was written in. So let me. You go, go ahead and read um, that. Hi, Katie. I was sent the Planning Commission agenda and I noticed the remodel proposed for the Hooper House at 106 Cliff Avenue. I'm not writing to comment about the plans. I do feel, though, that while the visible history is used to create and justify proposed alterations, the invisible history should also be taken somewhat seriously and not be metaphorically kicked to the curb. Therefore, I'm wondering if I could offer a few details that I think planning commissioners might want to be aware of because they relate to the story of the house. According to my long ago research, the house lot, lot 11, block M, was sold by F.A. Hinn to Catherine Lenton shortly after he opened the Depot Hill subdivision to buyers in 1888. Catherine was the wife of well-known San Jose architect Jacob Lenton. When Catherine died in 1890, the Capitola property went to Jacob and his children. His son, Theodore, 
was also an architect and is believed to be the designer of the Cliff Avenue House. Reflections of the Past, an anthology of San Jose, edited by Judith Henderson, includes a description of the Marine Social Club, founded in the 1870s. Several of the early members built summer homes on Cliff and Central Avenues in Capitola, including the Lentons. Jacob and Theodore were also listed as designers of the San Jose City Hall, Hall of Records, Odd Fellows Hall, the original O'Connor Hospital, the San Jose Normal School, the Agnews Asylum, the San Jose Hotel Vondome, and many others. It concluded that they had made large contributions to the appearance of dwellings and business houses in the Santa Clara Valley. Members of the Lenten family, Michael and Maria of San Jose, sold the Capitola summer home in 1907 to Joseph Hooper, Harry B. Hooper's father. It's more likely the house was built around 1890, as it states in the Capitola Historic Survey, than in 1904. As far as it is known, Capitola has only one Lenten building. It's my hope that its future will be handled with care. Fond regards. Carolyn. That was uh, from Carolyn Swift. That was actually sent earlier today um, regarding this project. Hey. And with that, there's no more emails, and I'm going to just check the um, Zoom again for attendees. It does look like we have another hand up. Um, it's a phone number that ends in N1, I mean 915. And they are now uh, allowed to, they can now speak. All right. All right, let's keep this short. These comments have been coming, going uh, very long. We have a long agenda, please. You have three minutes. Thank you very much. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I've appreciated the good discussion I've heard tonight, and I want to thank um, the applicant for preserving the large redwood tree and the um, other tree on the property. A lot of times I see those just being cut down. So that's all I really want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Katie, can we move on to uh, Planning Commission deliberation then? We can, yes. All righty. Who wants to chime in first? Uh, Susan Westman, you may uh, speak. I will start. Um, try and hit all of our points. Uh, first, I would like to thank the architect because I think they have done a very nice job on the design of the remodel of the building, uh, as well as the ADU unit that's in the back. Um, for the cupola, uh, I'm agreeing that I think trying to lower the ceiling is a pretty silly approach. Uh, it seems to me that we could let staff determine if it's best for us to simply put a condition on this, um, maybe even have it recorded that that is not going to be habitable space, that it's going to be an attic, or staff may recommend that we go and do a variance for the floor area ratio. But uh, trying to modify that by lowering the ceiling or raising the floor doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, I, I have no problem at all with people having wood burning fireplaces. I actually have one in my house and it's what heats my house. Uh, so um, uh, I, I, I don't see any problem with having uh, a wood-burning fireplace. I do have a little difficulty where this one was, is located that it requires a chimney that needs to be 71 feet. I mean, excuse me, 41 feet. I think it was 41 feet. Um, so I would like to know if there's any way they can still have a wood-burning fireplace in the main house uh, but come up with a chimney design that's not quite so large as that particular one. Um, my biggest issue with the house is sort of the second floor rear yard deck. Uh, everybody knows that I'm not in favor of them. We have denied them on several other projects and I don't see any real justification on this project because 
um, just because it's a historical home that there should be a uh, large second floor deck on the side and rear of the property. I think it does have an impact on the adjacent residential neighborhood. Um, I can um, agree with the neighbor who's concerned about the chimney on the ADU. Uh, one of the things that we recognize with the ADUs is that they're being put in what typically would be sort of a backyard setback of a home and uh, we're allowing them because we want to have more additional residential units. Um, but I'm not certain that it's necessary for an ADU unit to have a wood burning fireplace, uh, which does sound like um, would have a negative impact on the neighbors. So at this point, that's where I stand on some of the issues. And I look forward to hearing from my other commissioners. Thank you, Commissioner oh, Weston. Any other hands raised? Uh, Commissioner Christensen. I'm just curious, I wanted to clarify, is the ADU under review at all right now? Is If, if they weren't coming in for another um, issue, would we be reviewing the ADU at all? I think the chimney exceeds what our standards are for ADUs and height. Okay. That's true, Katie. Um, I will have to make sure of that, but I don't think we have any exception to the 16 foot height for the ADU. So, um, and the, because of that, that could be under review, but otherwise the ADU, um, there's, as long as it meets the standards of, for the ADU, there would be no review by the Planning Commission on that. What about this uh, concern about the 15 foot height? Uh, he said that, that the uh, community member mentioned, Mr. Galena, I think said uh, uh, it should be a 15 foot and, and the 16 foot height is a variance or is he mistaken? It's not a variance. There's an exception in the code to allow um, the garage to be at a, 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 have additional height relative to the main structure. Um, other comments, uh, Commissioner Roots? Yeah. In regards to the cupola, uh, I don't agree with Susan on this one. <laughs> I would like to see a variance to make that space uh, usable. It just seems like such a ridiculous idea, as Courtney pointed out, to lower a ceiling in there where it's four feet high uh, and not be able to utilize that space. Uh, I think a variance would uh, add to the usable space and, and we should consider it. Uh, I've had the opportunity to tour some of the historic neighborhoods in England and Wales and seen a lot of the old Victorian homes there and tall chimneys are pretty typical. So I don't really have a problem with the chimney. I think it really adds the historical nature of, of of the house. Uh, on the second story deck, if you look at the way the neighbors to the, I guess it'd be the north and the, or the neighbors to the west and the neighbors to the south on each side, the way those houses are configured and with the ADU in the backyard, I don't see a lot of privacy issues on this deck. And I'm, I'm one that's always been adamant about second story deck, <laughs> but I don't, I don't see the issues with this deck that some of those, some of those other ones we've had before us have presented. Uh, I just think uh, Mr. Britton has really done an excellent job at, in keeping the historical nature of this house. And uh, those are my concerns or my comments. I would support a, a gas fired stove in the, in the ADU as I have, personally been subject to a chimney in about the same proximity to my house and the prevailing winds blew all the smoke right in my backyard. So uh, those are my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Ruth. Um, Commissioner Newman. Hey, it seems to me that uh, we need to continue this matter. Uh, and the applicant has uh, pretty much uh, invited us to do that. There are a number of issues that need to be uh, focused on 
one for one thing we need to um we we have to notice the variance for the cupola everyone seems to agree that uh just lowering the ceiling height to three feet 11 is a silly uh solution and a variance is a much better solution so everyone seems to support that but we do have to notice it so we're gonna have to come back anyway and then there are a few other issues here that maybe can be uh, pursued in the rehearing now that there's been a lot of input from the commission. Uh, the only one that I'll address right now is the uh, chimney height. And I, I don't really understand Mr. Britton's uh, uh, insistence on the right to a wood burning stove. I don't think that that uh, over um, trumps all design standards in the city. So that uh, I think they still have to satisfy our design standards or qualify for a variance. And uh, I think the staff report with regard to denial of the variance is fairly convincing uh, to me. So uh, I would leave it open for the new hearing, but that's my preliminary thought on that. Thank you, Commissioner Newman. And I'll throw in uh, my comments as well. Um, I think that the uh, unusable space is nevertheless considered square footage. So that's 325 square, square feet that we officially have to count. So that means, so how do you, how do you take care of that? Well, you, you, you don't add as much to the rest of the house. You don't mass the rest of the house. You have, you know, you want to add 600 and some odd square feet. Um, well, you're going to have to take into account the fact that you already bitten into that with the 325 square feet that exist already. Um, I'd be willing to, uh, again, uh, look at look at a variance. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why we have a variance. Again, uh, the, the architect talked about the, the historic nature of the home. I think this is a very unique case. So it gives us a lot of... Um, a lot of window to um, to accept that variance. I don't know that I would want to to agree with that variance. He's adding a lot of structure, including the garage and the ADU, and and now he wants to uh, not account the 325 square feet. But to me, that's a lot of mass, and you're added to you're adding to the um, neighborhood. But um, I'm willing to willing to listen to the other commissioners on that. I don't have a problem either with the uh, chimney height. Um, the reason being uh, that, uh, again, because of the Queen Anne style, I think Mr. Britton's letter showing the, the history of the Queen Anne design is adequate, uh, rational enough to uh, allow that variant. I also agree that the uh, wood-burning stove in the ADU is something that we should uh, consider a, a problem both to the neighbors and to the health of the uh, coastal redwood tree. So. Uh, with that, I think my side setback issues have been properly addressed, so I don't and insist on a change there. But um, but yeah, I think there's there's room for modifications in this design to make everyone happy. But I'm willing to listen to a motion. If anybody, oh, wait, we have another Can comment, one question? Commissioner Westman. So the variance that we're talking about for the cupola and the upstairs space is the full variance to the floor area ratio that was referred to by the community development director before. You know? Correct. Okay. Just wanted to clarify that a bit. Thank you. I, I also wanted to ask, could we, since we're getting direction, it looks like we're headed towards a continuation, get feedback on the second story deck from all commissioners just to, we can, before we do that, Commissioner Ruth had his hand up. Oh no, I was just scratching my head. <laughs> no, oh, well, you're you're Your online. Hands up. Oh, my. You have it. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so let's all put our hands on the on the on the deck. So Commissioner Ruth has already weighed in, and and, and did, would you like to reply to his thoughts, uh, Commissioner Weston? You you still don't like the second floor deck? Uh, I'm still not in favor of the second floor deck. I'll go back and look at it since it's going to be continued, but right now I would say no. Um, Commissioner I, Newman? I need to take a look at it too, and since we're going to have another hearing, uh, they'll give me an opportunity to do that. Commissioner Christensen? Um, at this stage, I have no problem with the second step deck, and I, 
I agree with uh, Commissioner the sentiment of privacy. And I don't have a uh, I don't have a, a problem with it either, except that I am sympathetic to the neighbor. Although we we don't guarantee a view, an ocean view. Um, if we are going to allow a second floor deck, which uh, which we generally don't do, um, it would be nice to accommodate the neighbor's wishes. It's kind of my two bits. So um, that's comments on the deck. So I'll move to continue this uh, item. Do we want to continue it to a date certain so we don't have to republic notice? We do have to republic notice because the, there's going to be a variance. Oh, you're correct. Thank you. All right. I have a motion for continuance by Commissioner Newman and a second by Commissioner Christensen. Uh, can we, if there's no further discussion, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Wu? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Aye. This item is continued. We'll get to go over this one more time. And I, let me just say I appreciate uh, the applicants for putting up with this. This is a big project, and you're doing a great job um, with a with a real big, real big project. And thank you for your forbearance of all of our questions and issues because this is a this is a big community uh, issue as well as a as a as a private one. Uh, with that, we can move on to item C, which is 410 prospects. Do we have a staff report? Sean, I believe you're on mute. Thank you for that. Okay, so I'm going to try and go through this one uh, as quickly as I can. It's a thematically similar to the last. It's a uh, application for a design permit, historical historic alteration permit, coastal development permit, and variance request to a historic two-story single-family residence at 1410 Prospect Avenue. So this is the proposed site plan. Uh, the project includes the demolition of an existing 1,606 two-story home, um, as well as the construction of a 1,422 two-story residence in its place with, uh, with a 796 square foot basement. That basement is not included in the 1,400 square foot number. The proposal would also remodel and relocate an existing uh, non-historic garage. And it also includes a variance request to construct the new residence uh, to retain current non-conformities non -conformities for required setbacks and poor area ratio. And you can see here again, like last time noted, some of the proposed, proposed removed and replaced trees. In orange, there are two trees in front of the subject property. One is a deciduous tree and one is a cypress. Uh, the applicant is proposing to remove both and replace them with one tree that is also off, off the site and one tree that is uh, in the front yard, uh, which would be a Japanese maple and a gold medallion tree. Uh, at maturity, these would meet, uh, this planning plan would meet the 15% canopy coverage requirement for development. here is, the, is a dashed line in brown that indicates the extent of the, the basement area. The basement is contained within the proposed first story footprint with the exception of two light wells. And like the previous application and presentation, I'm putting each elevation side by side existing proposed. This first one is the existing proposed front elevation. The existing proposed south side elevations. I want to note too, if we have to go come back to this, they're faint, but the architect has outlined the current extent of the, um, of the home underneath the proposed 
design. So that kind of gives you an idea of massing and general uh, design by comparison. So I, I can go over that as we go. This is the existing proposed north side elevations. And this is the existing and proposed rear elevations. These face the capital village. There's also a second story deck like the last application on the back side. This does not face any other residences, but um, yeah, we can discuss that as we move on. The preliminary evaluation by historian Leslie Dill found that the existing structure to be historically significant more in its neighborhood context than in preserved design or materials themselves, noting that much of the original structure had been modified, added to, or had its original materials been uh, covered or replaced. Staff met with the applicant and architectural historian, um, and on the basis of a replacement structure recommended that a proposal for a new structure should maintain the historic pattern and streetscape and scale of the existing site. Mr. Bergstein subsequently reviewed the proposed design and found it compatible with the standards, for, uh, Secretary of Interior standards for reconstruction, citing standards four through six as most applicable. I cover what those are here, uh, or at least the findings that Mr. Bergstein provided. Just to, to kind of cover that, the, the project maintains a unique streetscape and continuous roof line and scale with similar scale and massing as the, the existing structures. The new project shares materials and architectural features uh, as the original, including the asymmetric roof pitch, the front dormer, double hung windows, and cladding. The application also includes a variance request for both the maximum floor area ratio and the minimum setback requirements. Staff reviewed the project with respect to the required findings for variances A through F and the staff report of note that the application require a variance for the front, first, and second story setbacks and the rear. Um, the rest of the nonconformities on the garage are all existing and the applicant has either maintained those and not exacerbated them or actually improve them by relocating the existing garage entirely within the subject property. So to cover a, a bit of visual first of the existing site, uh, the project site is, is a shallow, irregularly shaped lot and small by capital standards. The highlighted areas represent the building envelopes that would comply with setback requirements for the R1 primary structures. The darker blue shows the first story uh, envelope and the light blue shows where a second story extent could be as well. Let me just go back to this photo again and for reference. This is Prospect Avenue from south to north. The subject property is the second to the end and it's one of the smallest. Staff reviewed the existing characteristics of Prospect Avenue along the bluff and found that the subject lot is one of the smallest lots in the neighborhood. And of the eight nearest properties, five properties appeared to exceed floor area ratios allowed within the zone of, of any standard. Um, with respect to setbacks, most homes on the bluff side of Prospect Avenue also do not comply with the front side or rear setbacks or a combination of the three. Of the nearest eight properties, seven do not comply with setback requirements. With that, staff recommends that the commission approve the project based on the commission's approval and findings or continue the application uh, and provide direction on what would need to be modified. Very good. Are the que are there uh, planning commissioners questions of staff? I have one, Mr. Wilkes. Uh, Commissioner Root, go ahead. Yeah, uh, has the applicant submitted a landscape plan for the area along the path? Are you referring to the the coastal access path behind the property? Yes. 
They have not. That that is actually beyond the subject property. It's on the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission property. Um, at this time, they're not proposing to do anything on that site except to remove an existing uh, low lying deck back in the backyard that encroaches into RTC property. How, how much is, does the RTC property extend on the west side of the path? I, I actually don't have that exact figure, but I can pull up the site plan because I think I did leave enough to see where the extent of that pathway is. This, this line right here is the property boundary on the rear side facing the, the bluff and the trail. The trail's noted in light gray right here. Um, I, don't, I don't have an exact measurement on that. I can get one for you if you'd like, but it looks like at minimum it's probably 15 feet away. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt the property owner is going to utilize that RTC property. Uh, I don't know. I'd like to see how we control what happens on that property because you know, it's going to get utilized by the by the property owner. So I, I can I can only add to that at this time that uh, our staff both in planning and in public works did speak both with the the architect as well as uh, a representative from the RTC about how they are looking at handling um, easements new easements on their on their property specifically along this area uh, among others because the encroachments are not unheard of uh, you know in their in the railway corridor um, as mentioned that there's nothing at this time that's been proposed we did discuss it with the applicant about what they were intending to do and they were we, we basically gave them the option that if they wanted to do some development there it was either going to have to be included in the package with some indication that they or had the tentative approval of a of the RTC, or that they actually had a lease in hand before we could consider it, and the applicant opted to um, not make any action at this time, other than to say that they're going to be removing the deck, which is a necessity for the construction of the home as it is. Okay, what what kind of engineering is tests and soil tests are required for the basement? We also spoke with our building official about this and, and also with the architect. They've already um, obtained some engineering on the, the structure, the civil engineering, as well as, from what I'm told, a, a geotechnical report. And speaking with our building official, Robin Woodman, um, I was told definitively that a geotechnical report would be required for, some, for the scope of this kind of work, and especially with her familiarity of this area being slightly sandy, loamy soils. So um, no one at this time, both in public works planning or, or in the building department, felt that a, um, a geological report was necessary from the available knowledge and the existing um, reinforcements of the site and that it wasn't you know, being actively eroded by City Ocean, um, but that a geotechnical report would be emphatically required. So that's, a, that's within the conditions already. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Any other questions of staff? Seeing no other hands raised, I have one question. So um, on 106 Cliff Avenue, we've identified that style as a Queen Anne style, very well known. Uh, is there a style of this particular house? I know it's an old house, but is it, is it consistent with any kind of recognized architectural style? So I, I don't actually have the evaluations in front of me, and it's, it's been a little while since I read them front to back, but my understanding was that they actually didn't have a specific design or, or represent a development pattern, and that was both in the fact that it was just, it, it seems that it was built and modified over time to address whatever needs of the current owner were. That was noted by, by the first historian, Leslie Dill. Yeah, the, the reason I ask, and, and I, my next question is probably going to be for the applicant, but um, I worry that since this has been called historical and it had a historical review, that the applicant perhaps unnecessarily tried to meet a style of, uh, of, um, 
architectural architecture that no one particularly um, insists on. So I'll wait and ask, and ask the applicant a question on that. Um, so with that, then we can ask uh, for public comments. Is the applicant here and that they want do they want to um, state their case or are, they, are there any other public comments? Yes, so we have um, Derek Van Alstein. Uh, Derek, you should be able to speak now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, well, it's been it's taken a while to get here, uh, but I'm glad you stayed uh, for the duration this evening. Anyway, um, I'd like to uh, to thank uh, staff for all the work they've done. I mean, this is, uh, this is a lot of thought has gone into this. Um, we, what we tried to do with this project is to make sure that we did the best we could with it with what we had. Um, so uh, to answer uh, Peter's uh, question, uh, no, it's a generic style and it just has to do with the pattern. The, the historical value has to do with the pattern of construction. Um, and in this house being built in 1901, there were six or seven houses that all shows up in the, uh, in the historic report. Um, a lot of these houses were, you know, weren't grand houses on the other, on the other side of the river, yeah, uh, but not so much on this side. Um, and they were pretty much uh, all worker bees. So you had fishermen and, and uh, plumbers and whatnot. Um, and that's how this whole uh, segment of Capitola was uh, was built, actually. And so the historian's point was, yeah, you can replace it, and but we don't want to lose the value of what it of what it does to the to the neighborhood. It needs to read as much as possible the way that it was before. Uh, before it was taken down. Um, so that's that's where we started. Uh, and as we went along, we tried every which way to get rid of as many nonconformities as possible. The, the, these property lines were all over the place. We were over um, on the front side by a couple inches, two and a half inches, I think. Um, the garage was uh, was over the property line. The, 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 some of the, in the rear was over the well, it wasn't the rear, but uh, definitely uh, the two sides of it and the uh, and the front. So um, that's kind of how this all developed. And it uh, the only way to uh, get them a usable space was to put an upper level deck in. Um, and obviously, you know, it's a great view there, and it's not going to bother any neighbors. I don't think there's any downside to the deck on, to the deck on this particular property. Um, we have started a conversation with RGC. Uh, they worked uh, slowly, uh, and we chose not to, to uh, saddle up and ride with them, but uh, we will in the future if, if they respond. So um, I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Uh, I, a couple things that I might throw in is that, yes, we've already started civil engineering. We already have a geotechnical geo geo report. Um, we have uh, engineers uh, already on board, ready to go. So we can uh, make sure that this is uh, safe and sound um, and that it's a good contributor to the neighborhood. So I'll be glad to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, so let, let me jump in since I kind of started down this path. Uh, of asking the historical question. The reason I asked that is because as I walked around it and saw that the existing house has shingles and your proposed house has shingles and the windows are about the same size, it made me wonder that if in fact you had a clean sheet of paper and there weren't all these historical requirements, would you and the applicant end up with the same design or did you feel unnecessarily constrained by the concern that uh, the, the Planning Commission would would insist on something historically accurate. Well, I look at it as a challenge. 
So, uh, and I think we met the challenge. I think we've done a good job of it. Is, would it be the same if we started out without a historical uh, context? Uh, yeah, probably it would be different. And, and I guess where I'm heading with that is I'm not asking you to redesign it or giving you permission to or whatever, that whatever that, wherever that goes, but just the notion of things like minor changes um, that that you might come along with, in my opinion, um, you know, that they tend to come back if they're quote, quote unquote significant changes, they're, they're, they're made to come back as part of the planning commission. And I wouldn't think that things like you decided not to go with the shingles or you decided to go with a different window style for whatever practical reason that uh, that hopefully that wouldn't, wouldn't drag you in front back in front of the planning commission uh, i just also want to just thank you uh, for uh, remaining in the community and continuing to contribute your significant architectural talent and design wizardry to our city so are there um, are there any other questions of the applicant? I mean, uh, the uh, architect, uh, the designer, seems like Susan Weston has a question. Yes. Go ahead, Susan. So, um, it's my understanding that with a historical structure such as this one, that if you don't get a sign off from the historical architect that you are, you know, replacing something in kind, that then you have to go through the process of doing an environmental impact report to remove a historic structure if you wanted to build something completely different. Is that correct? Uh, it can go that direction, yes. Um, but there's, it can. Right. Uh, so there's some advantages to you to putting back a structure that sort of the integrity of what is on the street now. Yeah, so if, if you look at the front of this house, and uh, Sean did a nice comparison, uh, the, we tried to make it feel like it did, to, or like it does today, when it's redone. So it has the same basic feature in front of the street. Okay. Um, and, and, and I get that, I, you know, I didn't try to make it be something else or make it be modern or be different, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very modest house. I think you've done a very nice job on the design. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of the designer? All right, then let's move forward with other public comments. Maybe do we have any? I think you're muted. Hey, he's muted, yes. Uh, do we Sorry, have that's not very helpful. Um, Jeffel, J E F S L, you're muted, but it's your turn. Yes, um, good evening, uh, Commissioner. My name is Jeff Lucchetti. Uh, I have a home at 5055 Jewel Street, uh, directly kitty corner to the house in question. And um, I received the planning package last Friday evening and started to take a look at it. And it raised some concerns for me with regard to um, the design and, and uh, uh, how it might affect uh, some of what I have. And, and um, so I met with the architect yesterday and uh, we looked at it carefully and tried to decipher what was really happening with the second floor uh, rear of the house. And um, we think we figured it out, but we weren't able to get it um, pinned down. Uh, the architect was supposed to raise this issue with you this evening um, and asked uh, if staff could possibly um, assist in, in resolving the issue, but lacking that um, that uh, request from the architect, I would ask for continuance of the matter. Um, there are too many discrepancies in the uh, applicant's uh, drawings and the staff a report that makes it difficult to understand exactly what's happening here. I can give you a couple examples. 
uh, on the product uh, project um, data sheet for the architect, uh, he indicates that the proposed height is 23 feet. And on the development standards from the city, the uh, staff is indicating that it's 24 foot 4 inches. So there's a discrepancy there. I don't know which one it is. Uh, secondly, um, on the second story side yard, um, the first story side yard is 10 foot setback. On the second floor, it indicates 5 foot 9 with a variance. I'm not sure how that's happening because that would suggest that it extends over the side of the house. Uh, so that's, that's a bit confusing for me. Um, when you look at the uh, project data sheet from the applicant, the rear yard, first and second floor says 20 foot setback. And when you look at the um, development standards uh, on the city sheet, uh, it says uh, that on one side it is nine foot eight and on the other side it is seven foot seven. Uh, I can go on if you'd like, but there's enough inconsistencies between the two reports here that I feel it's necessary to continue this uh, and let the applicant and staff uh, decipher what is really happening here. Uh, the drawings that uh, are issued with the um, packet are not to scale and there are no dimensions on the drawings that would lead me to, to what's actually happening here. So I would like a uh, further opportunity to review it uh, and work with the applicant on my concerns. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you a question, uh, Jeff. Uh, I can't remember your last name. Uh, do you have any overarching concerns like mapping or the second story deck or setbacks or something that's not you know, detail specific but an overarching concern? Um, my primary concern is, is of you that uh, this um, variance is allowing to, to that's going to interfere with the view that I have from my house. And I would say, um, you know, normally speaking, when you design within the uh, zoning code um, and uh, you want to build a second floor, you have every right to do so, and your neighbor has no right to complain uh, because you are working within the, the standards set by zoning. In this case, they're asking for many variances and um, that is impacting uh, what I have and see from over here. Um, I think that the biggest issue I have with massing on the project is the second floor. The second floor area has been increased significantly and when you push this structure back uh, five feet uh, that they're, they're doing, it, it becomes um, taking out the cypress tree, uh, so on and so forth, it becomes quite quite uh, top-headed to me. All right, thank you. Are there any other uh, questions uh, from the public? Yes, there's more public comment. Um, sorry. Let's see. So next, we'll take the caller that the um, their phone number ends in 
to make sure, seemingly, that that would happen and follow through and be reported. But I have to wonder why a basement here? And I am, um, I do not see any discussion about high water tables. I wonder if that has been discu um, discussed, if there have been any testing for the groundwater level. I do know that Soquel Creek Water District has a groundwater monitoring well near that house. And having visited it once, I think that at certain times of the year, the groundwater levels can be quite high. It's called a perched groundwater table there. So that needs to be evaluated. And um, those are my main concerns that uh, I would much rather see a historic building preserved, remodeled, and kept intact than to completely be de demolished. And um, if it is demolished, I would request that all salvageable material be preserved and used. I saw something in there about um, historic wooden uh, elements being used, but that needs to be identified. And um, I'm, I'm very aware of the stats of the landfills these days, and we can't be uh, filling them up with uh, construction demolition materials. It needs to, we really need to be on top of salvaging things as much as possible. But I, again, would much rather see this not demolished at all, and that the heritage cypress tree be preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Steinbrenner. Uh, um, other comments from the public? Uh, you're on mute again, Kate. Sorry, next we have Steve Kell. Steve, you'll just have to unmute yourself. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Um, my name is Steve. I'm from probably right across the street. I'm right into the corner. Uh, Steve, you're breaking up a little bit. Is there a way to maybe shake yourself off speaker or something? We can, you're right, we're missing every other word. Across the 
with allegations of three parking spaces. Where are the Russians to move up? Only to that that we've done is shifted the footprint of the proposed structure to the wrong way for LFIB, which didn't text for Okay, uh, Mr. and Steve, I'm going to have to cut you off. Your time is up. Let me try to summarize because you were breaking up. Let me try to summarize uh, your issues. One is you you don't like the fact that where the the the, uh, the house was located. It was been moved to the right. That affects parking, and uh, you think that accommodations could be made to improve the parking. And then the cypress tree, you'd like to preserve that. Are those the, your three items? Three items? Yeah, yeah, that's essentially it. Uh, I'm going to write it in to the uh, area of the elbow seat to Alex Jones, who might be the owner. Okay, uh, yeah. Steve, I'm sorry. Uh, you're, uh, uh, you're really breaking up. We're going to have to move, up, move ahead. Uh, yeah. I apologize I for the bad sound know. quality. Um, Katie, are there any other public comments? Um, yeah. Um, no other public comments. I am going to now check the email and no, just an email for our next very good. Uh, let's move on, on to Planning Commission deliberation then. Uh, does anybody want to weigh in, weigh in first on this issue? Or submit a motion? Uh, Commissioner Root. Yeah, I just say, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to go inside of this house, but I've, I've been in there and I'm not sure architecturally how you would uh, define it, other than maybe glorified shed. <laughs> if, if you if you lay down on the living room floor, you would wind up in the in the corner towards Depot Hill and has <laughs> such a tremendous slope. So you know, I I think the possibility of preserving it are pretty nil. And uh, you know, my only concern is the basement. And uh, hopefully the staff can decipher the engineering report that comes back and uh, proceed from there. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Christensen. Um, I agree with Nick, or yeah, with uh, Commissioner Ruth. I think this is going to be a great refreshment to this building. Um, there's no preserving it. I think I read in the report it said that um, this, this, you know, the structure doesn't really have any architectural historical significance. It's just that old. Um, I think that um, Mr. Manalski uh, did a, a good job in revamping everything, especially for such a small post stamp of the parcel. Um, but yeah, I think it's. I think it's. I don't have a problem with it at all. I think it's great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Weston. Um, I pretty much agree with everyone's comments. Um, and I, I don't think this is a building that really can be preserved and remodeled. Uh, and I think that the architect has done a nice job um, creating a design that still fits into the neighborhood. Um, I do wonder if we want to continue the item since the issue of some discrepancies on the measurements was saved um, by uh, one of the members of the public because um, unfortunately with these kinds of projects, you know, six to eight inches does matter. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, I'm in favor of the project. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Newman, uh, any comments? Uh, no comments. Uh, Commissioner Christensen, you still have your hand up. Did you have more comments or? No. Okay. I, uh, 
I would make a motion to approve. Do we have to consider? Do we have a motion to approve? Is there a second? I'll second it. We have a motion to approve by Commissioner Christensen and a second by uh, Chair Wilk. Uh, any discussion on this? On why we should or should not um, approve this project? Yeah, I would like to see the discrepancies in the measurement uh, resolved first. Uh, uh, Can I here? We agree that there are discrepancies in the measurements. I mean, we have a commenter saying that there are discrepancies. Can can staff verify that there are there, these many errors? Thank you, Chair Will, for that opportunity. Uh, I was looking at some of the, the hard copy plans here in my office while we were getting some of those comments. Um, I'm not sure if the the caller was referring to going between what was on the planning on the plan sheet table as opposed to what's in the staff report analysis. Um, but if so, I mean, we don't normally require that their figures match ours. We're mostly looking that their project meets development standards, so sometimes they're not going to match exactly. Um, but as far as the development table itself, the, I, I did go through it a bit. The existing and proposed types um, are accurate, so uh, there, there is no issue based on that and what the plans measure to. Um, and then I, the one thing I did know was on the side yard, second story, uh, the proposed cell should say, it does say 10 feet, um, it should say north, and it also, but it does specify the south by uh, dimension of feet. Um, so the setback numbers are correct. It doesn't articulate whether or not the top setback is north or south, but the following figure does. So um, that was the only discrepancy I noticed. You might have mentioned a different setback standard, but I, I'm not sure. I did actually get calls from a number of the people submitting public comments tonight on this project, uh, beginning of this week, I believe. And that was noted while they called us that it was a typo, so it, I thought it was amended, maybe it wasn't, but that should be accurate. Um, and if there's any other questions about the other comments that were raised, I can, I can go down the list. Yeah, I would hate to have to uh, have a continuance on this just on a bunch of drafting cleanup issues, if that's kind of what they are. I'm sure staff is going to be able to ensure that and the building inspector is going to make sure that everything is is the code and the drawings are are accurate um that resolves that resolves my question Jack yeah, that's fine okay um, commissioner wilk um i also looked at the plans quickly in the development standards table and they seem to match up i do see however that the architect is raising his hand and since the neighbor approached him on this would you like Again on this to see if, if there are known discrepancies that could be cleaned up? I would. Okay. Okay. Um, Mr. Van Alstine, you I, speak. I'm here in center stage. Uh, I also noticed the way, I think it was the way it was put together, and not only that, but the because of the angles and because of where the house is located and because of where the garage is located. The, the setbacks may seem odd, but I think they're correct. Um, you know, when we do it, it, it it's all done uh, in CAD, it makes, and the numbers don't lie. So all I can tell you is I think what we put together is solid. Uh, and there may be a, 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 people are having a hard time reading. All right. Uh, thank you, Derek. Um, are there any other questions before we call for a vote? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Louis, can we have a roll call vote, please? Sure. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Aye. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Westman? Aye. Chair Wilk? Aye. 
uh, uh, motion passes, um, and good luck with the project. Very good. Now we can move on to uh, item D. I know we're not the least bit tired yet, so we have plenty of time and energy to talk about Parkland. We have a staff report. We do. Um, so, I, the presentation will be um, made this evening by Michael Arnone. So Michael Arnone and Jennifer Cooper have been working with the city on designing a parklet for um, the village. Uh, proto the prototype design. And first, I just want to give an overall update. I, I did this quickly at our last planning commission meeting, but our um, ordinance is under review currently by the Coastal Commission. We were hoping that it would be reviewed next week in April. Um, but we've hit a couple roadblocks and some items that we need to work with the Coastal Commission on. So we're hopeful for May, um, and we'll continue to keep the Planning Commission and the City Council and the public updated. Uh, we'll be sending out the, we're going to be discussing uh, a possible continuation of the temporary program at the April 28th meeting, and we'll get notice out to the um, all the businesses in the village that they're aware that we're re looking at this. But the purpose of tonight is to look at a prototype design. Um, we wanted to get some preliminary feedback because once the Coastal Commission does um, certify our ordinance, we will be taking this design forward to you for a coastal development permit that any business will be able to utilize. Um, so and free of charge, they just have to, they have to educate the construction, but the design will be free. So with that, I will hand it off to um, Michael Arnone and Jennifer Cooper. And would you like me to, sh would you like to share your slides, Michael, or shall I? Um, you know, either way, Katie, uh, Jennifer can share her screen if you can do that, Jennifer, and then uh, you can kind of move through it at your own pace. So. Sure, sure. Uh, either way, we'll try to get through this fairly quickly. I know it's late. You've been you've been sitting for a while, so uh, I'll let Jennifer go ahead and introduce uh, the product, and uh, we'll um, we'll just talk through it. Okay. There we go. Is can everyone see it? Okay. Yeah. So, like Kate said, we're here to share the conceptual design guidelines for the Capitola Parklet. Um, we're still in kind of the design development phase of this at this time. Um, but the main goal at this, uh, at this point was to provide a design that kind of complemented the existing streetscape of the Capitola Village um, and also made it so that there was consistency between all the parklets that are implemented by the business owners. So we have a design framework that um, they can work from. Um, and also a design concept that's fairly easy for them to implement that doesn't require you know, a lot of complex construction. Um, so the, the concepts that you'll see uh, in this document work for both the uh, angled parking places and, and the parallel parking places that are in the village. And um, the components that are part of this concept are the dining platform that you see here, raised planters, uh, a railing detail, uh, wheel stop, a uh, trench drain to address the, the stormwater uh, runoff and, and drainage, as well as like the, the dining amenities that um, that the business owners might want to implement things like uh, string lights and, and obviously the dining furniture and, and the umbrellas. Um, the main difference between the uh, concepts that we've come up with is the actual planter itself. Um, there's Excuse me, Jennifer, can, before you leave that previous slide, could I just get mm -hmm. a clarification? Sure. So that, that I'm looking at the bike rack and the wheel stop. And imagining mm -hmm. a car next to it in the parallel uh, or in the angle of parking, how does the bike get there? Is, is the wheel stop, should the wheel stop be on the other side or? Um, I think the, the purpose of the wheel stop is to kind of keep people from turning into that space and 
So yeah, it's not ideal for um, the bikes to park there. Um, I mean, the access isn't ideal. They could squeeze between, but perhaps or come around from the sidewalk. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a good, you know, there's two to three feet of space. If you look at the scale between the end of the left end of the wheel stop and where that line is, if if a car is actually parked between the lines, uh, then a bike should be able to get through there fairly easily. Where they left over, you know, the wheel stop, or like Jennifer said, they come at it from the sidewalk. But um, the wheel stops also could be, you know, that's that's showing a certain length. They we can get them there, you know, slightly smaller than that as well, give you more room. Thank you. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. That's, that's okay. Um, yeah, so going into the elevation and talking about the difference between the two planters, um, one option would be a fiberglass planter, another option would be a concrete planter. Um, the, the dimensions are similar. The main difference between them is the weight of the planter. The, the concrete planter is about 1,500 um, pounds, where the fiberglass planter is you know, 465 pounds. So that weight creates a more sturdy kind of solid barrier between the roadway and the parklet. Um, aside from that, one minor difference is the height of, of the planter. The, um, the fiberglass planter is about half a foot taller, which it doesn't seem like is a lot, but it, you can kind of see in the elevation the is <coughs> different, and it, it kind of gives a more uh, feeling of enclosure or sense of enclosure with the taller with the taller um, with the taller planter. But um, I think the key thing to focus on would be that safety aspect between um, the two the two planters. Uh, moving on to the parallel configuration for the parallel parking spaces, we've gone with a little bit uh, longer planter. So there's more of um, a barrier there, less uh, railing space. You kind of see it in the elevation. Oops. Here, um, you know, better better barrier between um, the road and and the parklet. Yeah, part of that, you know, is the the parallel spaces we're talking about are on Cap Ave. Uh, you know, the brewery right now has one, and it's you know, if you, Jennifer, you go back to the plan view. Um, that's about the you know the right dimension. It's, it's exactly the right dimension. It's 42 feet. Um, so that's that's kind of what they have now uh, you know, in terms of the size of the space. But you know there because of the amount of traffic and the narrow nature of Cap Ave, you know we felt that it was <coughs> to, the, the uh, security of the thing is a little more important on this street. So. You know, I think that's why the planters are a little closer together, and they're you know they're done that way purposely for the safety. Um, and, the, and the wheel stops, as you can see, are on either end um, uh, for people that are parking on those you know spaces that are adjacent to uh, to our little wall parkway here. Okay, so and then moving on to the actual uh, components themselves uh, for the platforms or the deck. We have two different kind of options. One would be a wood frame deck with a leveling mount that uh, allowed the grade to be, you know, a grade change between the crown of the road and uh, the curb you know, so that the deck can be level pulled. Um, in terms of the actual decking itself, it could be like a plastic wood decking, recyclable plastic wood decking that would be. Um, pretty durable and low maintenance or if someone wanted to do something like a natural redwood decking that would be an option too. Um, and then another option in terms of the how the deck is supported are these bikes and pedestals which are typically used in like a, a roof rooftop decking um, and these pedestals are what you know frame or support the deck and they're adjustable. Um, to level the deck. And in terms of the decking material, there's a, a wood tile that's kind of like a parquet or a concrete tile. Yeah, you know, we should interject here that the, the platform that we're talking about 
is at the same elevation as the sidewalk and top of curb. So there is no step down. Uh, this would be totally accessible. Um, and that was uh, you know, one of the goals that we have. So that's, that's why this platform is raised. However we do that, but that's, that's the reason because we want the, uh, the, the platform to be level with the walkway. Right, right. <coughs> and then addressing uh, the way that stormwater can you know, proceed through the gutter you know, using some kind of a steel frame and a steel trench for a, this would be the platform uh, on this side and this is the curb and sidewalk here. So there's a clear space for stormwater to run through and a way to access um, that gutter as well as a detail that runs along the perimeter of the platform that allows water to flow you know, from the crown to the gutter. And in terms of the railing, uh, a simple wood railing, uh, a metal railing with a horizontal picket, or maybe even uh, some kind of a decorative metal screen that, you know, this is what bridges the space between the two planters. This is an image of the fiberglass planter just to give you a sense of what it would look like. Again, the concrete planters, these are just images pulled off of the website yeah. of the manufacturers. They're not the exact dimensions of the ones that we're showing on the plan view. Um, a suggestion for the bike rack. Wheel stop. And then we kind of picked a couple of different types of, of the furnishing, you know, as we get farther into the you know, narrowing things down, there would be a schedule that the uh, business owner would choose from, you know, to be able to order these things and, and the colors, different types of chairs, depending on kind of what uh, looks they want to go with. Another option would be a, a set and, and different price points within these as well. Um, examples of umbrellas and stands and then also string lights if they wanted to incorporate uh, that for, for nighttime with uh, some kind of a way to suspend them with a, a deck mounted pole. Um, and then also part of that would be, or part of the final plan would be a suggested plant list with sun and shade plants, all plants that are drought tolerant and uh, that do well in planters. Excuse me, uh, Jennifer. I noticed that uh, Commissioner Weston has her hand raised. Did you want to uh, interrupt the presentation with a question? Uh, of course. Yeah. I just wanted to make certain I was reading the plans right. So when these dining areas come up next to the sidewalk, you show no railing between the sidewalk and the platform. Is that correct? Correct. So, um, there's nothing to sort of protect the diners from people going down the sidewalk or to stop the dining from, you know, somebody moving their chair out onto the sidewalk. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, getting back to the final two slides is the uh, suggested plant list or plants to choose from list that um, would be drought tolerant and you know appropriate for you know their sun shape requirements and um, and let's uh, I don't really have anything else to share that's kind of the end if anyone has questions I'll turn it back over to the commission yeah I'll just let me just throw in one thing there are going to be some site specific um, you know, things we'll have to figure out. Again, as Jennifer mentioned, this is kind of just a schematic of, you know, a concept that, uh, you know, you can look at and, and decide on. Uh, but there are manholes, there are some, you know, utility grates and things like that that are in the street, depending on where these actually go. And so in that case, you know, we'd have to come up with a way of having a removable portion of the deck surface uh, you know, and again, it's site specific to exactly where we are in the village, and, and that's something we've thought about. It just, um, you know, we, we haven't, we're not sure in a solution yet because the, the problem actually doesn't exist yet. So 
So what do you think about it? And, and it's something that uh, will have to be addressed, you know, when, when these get built. So I've got an overall question. Um, you mentioned that there's the, all these different options, like for example, on the railing, you said, okay, there's mm -hmm. these different railings. Are you suggesting that the applicant would have a choice of those railings or you're asking the planning commission to pick one? Um, I think both. I mean, I think we could offer two options, <coughs> like let's say maybe the wood railing and the metal railing, but if there's strong opinions that we just want to do one, I think that would work as well. I also uh, just want to comment in the staff report we had raised that there's two types of um, planters proposed and we thought it would add, you know, the overall feel and look of the village to be consistent mm -hmm. with one planter and then give options for the railings in between. So we're hoping to get some feedback <coughs> on preferences for fiberglass versus concrete. Mr. Ruth has his hands up. One hand, anyway. And I do believe we have, um, once we get through questions, there's definitely members of the public interested in Yeah, Commissioner Ruth, you're on mute. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have a question regarding the, just the deck construction. Uh, the, the curb height is typically five inches, maybe six at most. And you've got the, the pedestals, but Rex decking requires joists every 16 inches. So I'm wondering how you fit the, the pedestals and the floor joists and the Trex decking within five inches height to make it match the level mm -hmm. of the side. Yeah, it depends on which approach, you know, they want to go with, whether they're going to use, you know, the tile style or the decking style, and there's other ways of doing this. You know, some of the other ones we looked at had, you know, the joists that are just shimmed, uh, follow the contour of the street, and are anchored that way, and then the decking sits on top. So there's, you know, in terms of construction, again, Nick, we, we haven't gotten to the point where we're doing a construction detail for this. Um, I think the purpose, and, and Katie can kind of, um, continue this but I mean it, it's really just to kind of give uh, the concept you know which which style of things you like at this point yeah just if there's not a lot of height to yeah. accommodate everything that has to be put into the construction of one of these decks thanks Mike okay uh, Mr. Christensen um, I worked with the pedestal in the past, and I think they're a great solution for this type of thing. With the, the either the the bike and pedestals or the leveling mount, um, so it doesn't require framing. It's been, I wanted to add that. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, <laughs> do uh, so. We're here. You're, so you're requesting uh, comments. <coughs> and um, so, so we, are we going to hear from the public first and then make our comments? Um, is that how we do this? Okay. Well, I just yeah, this is a presentation, just a general comment. So yeah, I'm sorry. So yeah, we have, so we have our staff presentation. We have gone through our planning commission questions, and now let's go to public comments. Okay, um, it looks like we've received an email um, from Doug Conrad, the owner of Capitola Wine Bar, and I'm going to have that read aloud right now. April 7th, 2022. Planning Commissioner, what a tough ride this has been, and unfortunately still continues to be. Business is still far from being that like it was before COVID. The beach is not as full as before. Parking spots once always filled all day go empty for hours. The sidewalks are less crowded. Our tourists and locals still have not returned to the village as they had before the pandemic. This is why restaurants and bars are still in a recovery mode. Asking us to invest now in the city's new park lent program is bad timing. We are still in a recovery mode and for the city to ask restaurants and bars to incur this high expense at this time is especially difficult. For some, it would be impossible. 
We ask planning to make the recommendation to City Council to extend the temporary parklet program to align with the rest of the state's outdoor dining program. The state has extended outdoor dining and to go alcohol service until December 31, 2026. This will give time for business to recover across our state. The time will come when the village business can afford to participate the city's program. When that happens, I would suggest focusing more on the safety for our customers sitting in the parking spots. Then Jose Ali in particular cars can achieve a high rate of speed and the current plans show no protection from traffic. Concrete pleasures are not traffic barriers. Every parkette should have enough bike parking for at least six eight bikes, ideally more. Parkettes need the ability to be anchored to the ground. Expensive stainless steel levelers save on labor, but anchoring and leveling to the ground would be safer and less costly for many reasons. Thank you for your time. Please recommend to Council continuing the temporary parkette program to align with the rest of our state so we can recover. Then, when we can invest correctly, we can build something safe that we all can be proud of. Thank you. Young Conrad. Owner. Capitola Wine Bar. Okay. So now we can move on to Planning Commission deliberation and comments. Anyone want to chime in? <coughs> uh, if not, I will. Um, my general comment on this approach, I, I like what, what you've done, and it gives me a, a lot of insight as to uh, what, we're, what we're addressing. I like the, the notion uh, of the planters and their placement, and like, okay, that's the consistent look of Capitola, our these planters in these locations. I don't like the design of the planters. I think perhaps the, the perhaps uh, just a uh, you know flat boxy planter could maybe we can improve on the design. Every single park that's going to be lined with these things. Maybe there can be some distinction in the in the planters. Um, I would tend to leak, I would tend to prefer the fiberglass simply because it's probably easier to move them um, because again these parklets might be coming and going and uh, something that's real permanent might be problematic uh, as uh, as the various restaurant owners decide to ignore their uh, or rather not renew their leases um, so beyond that I think that uh, the other thing I'd like to see consistent other than the planter would be the decking. So I'm, I don't really care what the decking is, but I think every every deck should should be the same. Like a sidewalk, you want to have a different different sidewalk on every block of the city. So I would want a consistent deck. But beyond that, I, I would think that the railings, furniture, and the lighting and all that that could be customized to the restaurants. And I wouldn't have any uh, any objection to a lot of stylization there. Those are my comments. Uh, Commissioner oh, Weston has their hand, her hand raised. Yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner uh, Weston. Overall, I, I think the design is really good. I think this is a great place to start. Uh, I, um, uh, it's hard for me to say if I like the fiberglass planters or the concrete ones at this point because I haven't really seen them. You know, I've seen some images taken offline um, so before we made that final decision you know we might be able to want to go someplace and actually look at them uh, if I had to stay tonight I would probably be inclined to go with the concrete planners just because I think they do create a better barrier between the vehicle and the dining area I do have major concerns about not having something that sets these areas off from the sidewalk. Sidewalks, particularly on the Esplanade, get very crowded on summer weekends and busy weekends. And I think not having something there to sort of protect the uh, diners and delineate that space 
uh, is, is going to be a problem. I think it's also going to be a problem with, you know, somebody deciding that they're going to push their chair out from the table a bit and suddenly we have a chair on the sidewalk and we have crowds and baby strollers and all of that going on. So I, I would like to see some delineation uh, in the area uh, where the um, dining area is butt to the sidewalk. Um, uh, it's fine with me for there to be some choices uh, about what kind of railing they want to have uh, uh, between the planters. Um, I agree maybe we want two or three choices um, that would be available for the applicants to, to choose. Um, I, I, I do like the fact that the decking is going to be level with the sidewalk. Uh, rather than have sort of the funky ramps that we have right now that go down to the street and, and the dining's on the street. Uh, and I like the, the lights that are being proposed and the furniture. So those are my comments. Let me just chime in then and say that I agree with at least your comment about the, uh, the uh, sidewalk delineation between <laughs> the parklets because you're right, that that would be a problem. So, so another vote for that. Uh, Commissioner Newman. Okay. Um, from the standpoint of landscape architecture, it all seems nice to me, except uh, I didn't see any heaters. But it's hard for me to focus on uh, decking and details of design and a program that, to me, from a land use and <coughs> zoning standpoint, is such a major, potentially major change in our city and has not been adequately dealt with, in my opinion. And moving to a more permanent uh, solution to these parklets uh, without having really thought through all the ramifications of that, just because we had this emergency COVID response, um, it's really hard for me to digest. Um, our commercial parking ordinance is just completely destroyed now by all of this and there are other aspects of our it's just a it's a game changer long term for our community and all the consequences and unintended consequences of it have not been thought through and so it's hard for me as i say to, to worry about uh, the size of an umbrella i agree with the commissioner newman well, as I do, uh, but uh, when I ask them, uh, they ask that the, the, the top would be limited to design and not whether or not or where we want the park with. So, uh, any other comments? Uh, let's see. Courtney, have your hand back up again. Yeah, just had, had a quick question. Are there um, going to be any type of uh, requirements on maintaining the plant from the plant selection list so they don't die and um, everything looks shabby kind of thing. Just a, like a, a question for staff, I guess. Uh, Am I on mute? Yeah. Sorry, no, I can hear you. I was on mute. There are maintenance standards within the draft ordinance um, to maintain. I have it pulled up right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Trash and maintenance, there's uh, an outdoor dining area and public right of way shall be maintained in a clean and safe condition as determined by the city, including as follows. All trash shall be picked up and properly disposed of. All flower beds and planters shall contain live, healthy vegetation. All tables, chairs, equipment, and structures must be kept clean and operational. Mm -hmm. So there is. Hey, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> okay, Commissioner Weston, your hand is back up. My hand's back up. So, uh, 
this may be too late, but I really object to the term parklet because that implies that this is a space that's going to be open to the public. And um, uh, it's my understanding that the public's not going to have access to this space even when they're not being used by the restaurant. So I would much prefer if we could start calling them, you know, outdoor dining decks or something that is a more appropriate term for what they're going to be. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Uh, Mr. Roos. Yeah, I, I like the design on paper here. I think they look great. But I think when we sandwich those designs in between uh -huh. parked cars, they're not going to look so great. And uh, while I support the design aspect, I just don't support the locations we're going to allow them. Oh, I don't either. Um, Commissioner Christensen, you have your hand up still? Or no, 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 I keep forgetting to lower it. Sorry about that. Okay, well, that was, you know, it, this is my first meeting where I actually figured out how to actually look at the hands raised. So it's <laughs> new for me, too. Um, okay, I see no more hands raised. The, the staff uh, feel that they've gotten adequate feedback from the Planning Commission. Um, I, I think so. I'm not hearing um, <coughs> a preference, to, or I'm hearing two, I've only heard two preferences on the design of the planters, um, and they're not in alignment, but it sounds like you'd like to see some examples that we, uh, Commissioner Westman mentioned, maybe taking a look at examples of the designs locally. Anyone else have feedback on? Um, well, let me pull the string on that a little bit. So, the, the, my issue on the planter, and maybe I can, we can see if anybody else agrees with this, is that the notion of, okay, what is consistent with Capitola? Okay, all of these parklets have the same planters in front of them. And we can debate on the, the height or the width or whatever the space is, but. My, my thought is that's what's consistent. That's what gives Capitola its consistent feel. That and, and, the, and the consistent deck. Um, I don't particularly like the flat, boxy planter, but my question, I guess, to the rest of the staff, that do they agree that the planter and their location should be the dominant feature uh, of the Capitola design of the outdoor dining units? I think the biggest heftier ones are probably the most reasonable ones because it's only a matter of time before somebody gets mowed down while they're sitting having a cocktail. But you like the idea of having a consistent uh, look from carpet yes. to carpet? Yes. Okay. And, and I'll chime in that I believe um, our public works director also is in agreement with Commissioner Ruth assessment that the heavier concrete does provide more protection to its weight than the fiber <coughs> Okay, so there's uh, any any other consistent looks that we want to bring out? You know, again, I said suggested that maybe the railing could be something that's very independent. Um, but are there any other consistent looks anybody wants to see? I agree with Commissioner Roof. I think you need to have the taller planters, particularly on the street side, to try and provide a buffer from the diners and the cars going by them. And I'll agree with that as well. So, um, for the, and I think you said those were the fiberglass ones, so, but I'm certain the concrete planters can come in any size we decide we want. I believe they can, but if um, Jennifer, if you could chime in, we did a lot of, I think Jennifer did a lot of pricing and sure. seeing what would be like the better, you know, the feasible options out there and that's, that's how we ended up with these two. That's, that's correct. The, the um, finding one that was uh, bigger or taller have that shift is pretty cost prohibitive. I mean, they just end up being quite big. And uh, um, 
and finding a local person or a local manufacturer has been challenging too. So the shipping cost is, is the main item. The concrete planter itself is not as expensive as the fiberglass, but the shipping cost is what is what um, makes it um, more, or more in line with the fiberglass planter. The other thing, you know, keep in mind that the either the fiberglass or the concrete, uh, there are different colors available. So, you know, from parklet to parklet, um, you know, we could switch the colors. There would be consistency of the form and, the, you know, the height and the shape. Uh, we could, you know, even within a, one parklet have, you know, different colors if you wanted something a little more, uh, you know, like the Venetian, <laughs> you know, the different tones and colors, but the same, you know, material. So, uh, there's there's some ways to, I think, Peter, you're, you're concerned about the, you know, monotony of the thing. Uh, you know, keep in mind these, these do come in different colors. Go ahead, Courtney. I was just wondering why, if there's a reason why there's not, uh, I mean, I know you've provided two options for simplicity's sake, probably, but um, did, did, did you consider um, steel, like a fortune steel or anything like that? That would be um, kind of, they, they mean, they make them tall mm -hmm. and they can be attached to concrete or stacked on top of that deck or anything like that and they withstand weather. Yeah, yeah, we, we did consider that and I think the general consensus was that they were a bit too rustic in style for the for the existing streetscape that's down there, but I'm totally open to, you know, suggestions and, and exploring that avenue if people think that's a, a good way to go. Okay, any, any, any more comments or staff, do you have any more questions of uh, the commission? I think we've got some great direction. So we'll look more towards the concrete, but at a higher, if we can find a, a reasonably priced higher um, planter. It also sounds like uh, chair wheels you'd like to see. Maybe some other style that's not so square or rectangular. Well, I'm not insistent on that. If, if the, the, the if the uh, you know selection is limited, and um, you know as uh, as was mentioned, perhaps you know there could be some color variation or something to get some interest in it. My concern would be you know mostly is like okay, this is the, the planters are the look that we're we're going after in, in Capitola, so we should pay attention to what those planters look like. So they they might be all over. The place. Um, but you know the notion of just a blank, blank uh, side uh, might be might be okay. I you know let's not focus on that. Let's focus on other things in the park. So I mean on the outdoor dining establishment. <laughs> I know you gotta you gotta help me, Susan. What do we call these? <laughs> outdoor dining, street dining deck. Street um, dining deck. I also heard that um, we'd like to see um, some type of separation between the sidewalks to protect the diners. Yeah. Um, uh, it sounds bear. like, what's that? Well, I don't know if it's separation, but it would be like, you know, some sort of barrier, like, I don't know, maybe a curb cut or, or a, not a curb cut, but not something. Oh, something that can... prevents the sidewalk from being interfered with so the yeah. staff can have a good right away. We could use the railing that's shown in the in the slide that's on right now. That railing could be, you know, used um, an anchor to the platform on uh, you know three sides and have a you know a generous opening to get in wherever you know the restaurant deems they want to have that people entry. So yeah, I think that's a, a really good addition, and that's fairly easy to, to you know just implement. I, I would just point out though that um, you know I've been a lot of places where you know now that we've designed it we. It's on our minds everywhere we go, we look at the different uh, details that different cities are implementing. And I, I really haven't seen any that have a barrier between the sidewalk and the dining area. That's true. Well, I would yeah. disagree because I can, I've seen several. I can send you some photographs. Sure, sure, yeah. I was, I, yeah, I was just pointing that out that, you know, I was, I was in New York recently and then um, other places and I, you know, I didn't notice that. So. Well, pulling the string on that a little bit, I was just wondering, if, could, could there actually be a, a, an, an ordinance that says, okay, 
you know, the, the tables that are close to the sidewalk have to be anchored and they have to be X number of feet away from the sidewalk so that, so that, that you know, dining creep wouldn't occur. I mean, there might be more than one way to solve the problem. Might be easier to put up the barrier. It probably would be easier. You know, and they can have a wide opening space to mm -hmm. get in. It's, it's just to, you know, protect everybody, particularly in areas like the Esplanade that gets so crowded, you know, on the weekends with strollers and dogs and people and lines go to keep from my heart. And, you know, I think we have to sort of establish territory. As a diner, I would prefer some separation if I'm sitting in a table next to a sidewalk. Yes, I would too. Okay. Jennifer, could you bring up the other railing types? I want to, I'd like to get some feedback on, are there any of these railings that are shown that you're, you don't support or would you like us to bring back other designs? Personally, I think the railing could be could be uh, dependent on the uh, restaurant. Let, let let that be a design choice of the applicant. I think the top picture is too solid. I think I need more of a view through it. I want to be able to see that car coming at me so I can jump out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Must be getting late. I think we're getting punchy. <laughs> <laughs> it would been punchy. I have one more question, though. Well, I have you. Um, any other comments on railing before we? Well, I actually, on second thought, agree with with the Commissioner Roof that you're, you're right. It should be it should be more of an open railing, so it shouldn't be completely up to the applicant. So, uh, for me. If they want to, and, and I've seen this in place, if they want to continue the planters on around, you know, that would be another option. Uh, probably a lot more expensive, and so most of the restaurants wouldn't do that, but uh, I could give them that option if they wanted it. Even no spaces, Susan? <laughs> uh, or with the spaces, like they're going to have um, <coughs> the planters with the various types of railing in between it, same way they're going to do on the front. They could, you know, carry that around if they wanted to. Okay. And then okay. Sh should the decking be consistent and match throughout? We, we've built in a few options. Um, definitely heard support for keeping it level with the sidewalk, but we want them to have options in decking or require one type of decking? I would prefer one type. I don't know that I have a strong opinion one way or the other on the decking. Most of it's going to be covered up with tables and chairs and diners, so uh, I'm sort of open on the decking question. I, I agree. Either I either the pavers or the, the wood seems like two great options. So the question is, do you want something consistent or do you want to have multiple options? So you prefer multiple options? Yes. Okay. At least the, the two options. Two options. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I think hey, that's Okay. Phew. We got a little input and a little discussion on parklet. So we'll move then on to number Dining five. deck. Dining deck. <laughs> Gosh darn it. I'll get it right. Uh <laughs> number five, director's report. Uh, there is no director's report this evening. We do have our special meeting coming up on April twenty first at five PM our continuance on SB9 and objective design standards. Okay, any uh, commission communications? Item number six, final commission communications. Seeing none, 
I will just mention that, as Katie pointed out, our next meeting is April 21st at 5 o'clock, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Thank you. everyone.